Hi, and welcome in today's video where we'll go over one of the machines from the last warehouse hunt. It's an IBM 300PL new old stock type 6562. We'll quickly go over the ports and options and we'll open it to know more about what makes it tick. Then we'll try to fire up the machine. I believe it was shipped with Windows 95 pre-installed, so we may clone the hard drive to get an image of the HD from factory. And if this video is online, probably everything is in working order, so I'm planning on setting it up and run some benchmarks. Released in late 1997, the PC300PL was a business-oriented machine with some advanced functions such as Wacom LAN, remote BIOS update, and full hardware monitoring. Some other perks were the asset management features and intrusion detection that weren't available on the consumer-grade products of the time. This very variation of the PC300 was even awarded the Editor's Choice from PC Magazine in December 1997 for its value and serviceability as the machine was promoting its tool-free chassis. With a base price of 2650 US dollars, which in 2019 with inflation factor represents roughly a significant 4240 US dollars, it was positioned between the base GL and the high performance XL version. Based around the Intel 430HX chipset, which was an average performer for the period, my unit came equipped with a 166MHz MMX processor, and this motherboard could support up to 233MHz. The 300PL then rapidly evolved to Pentium 2, then Pentium 3, before the series was withdrawn and of 2000 replaced by the NetVista and the well-known IntelliStation series. The case has a classic late 90s look and feel, with some nice touches such as the front panel audio connectors and the volume control for the integrated speaker. It's shipped with a 3.5 floppy drive but no CD-ROM, which was an interesting decision. I guess it wasn't deemed required for a professional workstation with such networking capabilities. On the back, we have the standard serial and PS2 ports, integrated Ethernet and graphic adapter, but also two first-gen USB ports. Quite a novelty for the era. Opening the case is indeed screwless and quite easy, simply lifting the two plastic tabs and the cover lifts off to reveal the inside. The motherboard layout is simple, and expansion cards can be connected through the two ISA and three PCI slots on the riser card. The CPU is simply cooled by a passive heatsink, taking some breeze from the unique front case fan. My unit is probably an early run as it was shipped with a single 32 meg EDO RAM. The machine is supposed to accept up to 384 megs of regular or ECC RAM. The next good surprise is the integrated Matrox Mystic GPU with 2 meg of SG RAM, which provided excellent 2D performances but rather mediocre 3D, which wasn't really the intent of the machine anyways. I was surprised to also see the Matrix expansion buses to add an additional 2 meg of video RAM or an accelerator such as a Rainbow Runner. Behind the rather weak 150 watt power supply is the drive bay with a stock 2.1 gigabit hard drive that could only use PIO4 transfer rates as the motherboard didn't support Ultra DMA. That's it for the tour, so let's add a CD-ROM and try to back up that hard drive. The BIOS boot process is insanely long and after attempting to clone the partition, I sadly realized that the drive was failing, and it got worse every time I attempted to recover a new file, until it completely died and wouldn't be recognized by the system anymore. I've been able to back up all the files onto an SD card, but it obviously had some integrity issues, as it wouldn't boot further than the Windows logo. Never mind, now we have a CD drive, let's install a fresh Windows 95. I've installed all the drivers, but the USB wouldn't be properly detected until I installed usbsub.exe from the Windows 95 CD-ROM. Now, the user experience is what you could expect from a machine of this era. I've later installed Windows NT4, that was another option for this machine back then, and it also performed OK. Benchmark scores are similar to my other 166MHz custom build, exception made for the presence of L2 cache, increasing the memory bandwidth. Now, if you're considering this machine for a retro gaming rig, its off-the-shelf 3D performances are quite awful. DOS games are behaving correctly and sprite-based games such as StarCraft are running okay. However, 3D Mark 99 couldn't run most of the tests, and the ones who did appeared without texture at all. Not even mentioning the catastrophic frame rate. In conclusion, this is a great workstation with a unique retro design like we can't find anymore, well-built and right in the era, but 
I mean, it will stay a boring machine unless you're adding a Voodoo accelerator and a CD-ROM and upgrading the RAM and the hard drive. Only then it could become a powerful DOS and early 3D gaming machine. That's it for today. I hope you liked the video and, as always, thanks for watching.